So my focus is the Ethereum bridge. And uh, it's been very interesting because in doing the work on the Ethereum bridge, um, I've had to redo a few different things for um, the same kind of cross system, cross chain communication that will work for PBAS. So at the end of the day, when this is all working, basically the Ethereum bridge is going to be pretty much the same as PBAS. Um, and, and so uh, what that means is that a PBAS chain has, you know, will have multiple tokens capable on it. Um, Ethereum does. And so things are going well, but that, you know, we have to get this absolutely correct because when money starts flowing in on Ethereum and bi-directionally, everything's got to be 100% right, you know, in the provability and all in both directions and, and everything else. And so the, but one of the really cool things that's coming out of this is that so we're going to have a gateway currency, and I'm not going to say what the gateway currency's name will be, but it's going to be similar to ETH, you know, and we're thinking VETH. Um, so I, I can't, I, I don't want to say for sure, but that's kind of what we're thinking. So it'd be, so the idea would be that um, VETH would be on Varus the same as ETH, and then VETH would be a gateway that would allow uh, any ERC-20 token on Ethereum to be exposed on Varus and any Varus currency to be exposed, as we've already talked about. But then the other interesting thing is not just currencies exposed. So thinking about how users will actually use this, um, it's important to do all of the fee conversion and we have, as far as I know, the only DeFi system that's going to basically be the facilitator of this interoperability. So the way it will work is if I want to send um, Ethereum over to, to Varus, this is the simplest case, then I would send uh, Ethereum to the contract on Ethereum and I would give it a Varus address. So but the thing is that I just want to pay Ethereum fees. I don't want to pay Varus fees. And so, because I'm sending on Ethereum. So we're going to receive this transfer with Ethereum fees. And that is actually going to be routed to a gateway. And the gateway will be a multi-reserve fractional currency. For example... Ethereum, Dai, and Varus. So now on the Varus blockchain, this VETH comes out to the address on the next import of this um, Ethereum, Dai, Varus currency. Okay, and the fees that were sent over in VETH are actually left in that currency and. Fees are paid in Varus, okay? So now that currency, as people are sending from Ethereum, is basically converting the ETH to Varus. Well, there's another, so that's kind of the simplest case. Then there's another interesting case where, well, what if someone in Varus wants to convert VETH to DAI or, or Varus to VETH? Well, they can. It'll work just like any other fractional currency in Varus, so they can do that. But what if somebody in Ethereum wants to convert Ethereum to DAI or DAI to Ethereum or Ethereum to Varus or Varus on Ethereum to one, you know, and, and they just want to convert and use it as if they're on Ethereum? Well, the interesting thing is they can because we're going to enable the ability to effectively fund a second leg which allows a round trip so on ethereum someone will be able to send to an ethereum address 
and convert from die to eth or eth to die. And this is the first or or Ethereum to Varus or you know die to Varus. Um, and the funny thing is it will actually run, it'll go it'll go from Ethereum into the Varus system, run and come back. And doing that for anything, any reasonable amount of funds is still going to be a better deal than Uniswap. And so the interesting thing is that in looking at this, all right, so then we'll have this Varus Dai ETH bridge currency, which will allow fees to be paid on the way in, in ETH or Varus or Dai, actually. But then what about the other currencies that people make on the Varus system? And the interesting thing is, as long as a currency has um, the ability to convert from one of the source currencies, either ETH or one of the currencies that's being used in the conversion, so BAT, wrapped Bitcoin, whatever happens to be on Ethereum, then it would be able to accept and round trip a conversion as well as accept um, imports from the ETH system to be converted and then dropped into the Varus ecosystem. So now the interesting thing about this is at first what this means, so at, in, the, in the very first version, we are going to uh, only have the first gateway in place. But the model is going to allow this to work on any fractional reserve currencies and even on currency launches so that from an Ethereum perspective, people on Ethereum can look at the Varus system as if it's some crazily powerful contract system. But on Varus, it actually, uh, and, in, and especially with PBAS, it's an entirely separate system that's independent that even can scale and have all these capabilities and of course has you know the IDs with revocable recoverable IDs and everything else but from ethereum you could decide to interact with varus just by using it to convert currencies to you know um, use it as a better defi system and all of the volume that goes either from ethereum or from varus goes through the same system so anyways, that's, that's, there, I'm working like crazy on this. I, on, on timing, I do believe that we're, you know, my, my goal right now is to get, along with the people working on the other pieces, to get um, the test net up and running with an Ethereum test net this year so that this is working. But I think that the actual release of what this is is bigger than we, than I at least had kind of expected it to be on the Ethereum bridge because it includes functionality, and um, and I think that the final actually, you know, real release that allows you to send real funds over it and everything else is going to be early next year, um, and you know, we'll I'm sure that we can put together some announce for this, but. What I'd like to do is really get this running and working so that people can use it and see what it is we're talking about um, before really doing an official announce. So we're working like crazy to make that happen. But the protocol looks quite good. And it's, as I said, the same protocol and the same notarization protocol, which will allow for notaries and also a more advanced auto notarization than what we had before, which will, it's, it's not going to be enabled, I think, for um, real funds exactly at the same time as the ETH bridge with uh, notarization, auto notarization, I'm saying, in the PBAS. But it's basically all coming along together and it's more a matter of which one do we believe is really hard and so we can run you know tens of millions up to billions of dollars over it so um so that's generally where things are i'm happy to answer questions people might have about it if people have questions
I was looking at the uh, Uniswap fees. Why are they so high at like 2%? Do you know? Well, Uniswap is actually uh, 0.3%. But if you, depending on the size of your transaction, you might end up paying more for all the overhead. So um, you almost certainly will. And also Uniswap is more, is not, it's really hard to compare this with Uniswap in the sense that we're quite a superset of Uniswap and Uniswap includes a bunch of routing and all sorts of other stuff. But in the end of the day, Uniswap gets one transaction to do a conversion and runs it by itself sequentially, independent of all other, other transactions. So if you've got a lot of crossing back and forth, um, all it does is make the price go up and down and up and down and, you know, and bounce it around. Whereas if you've got a lot of crossing going back and forth on a Varus um, fractional reserve currency, which isn't just limited to the two that Uniswap is and can have multiple reserves and can send between them and can send, you know, to the currency directly. And it's not really this, like a, just this limited liquidity pool. It's really a currency then all of the ends that are aggregated together are processed together. And all of the equations are solved at the same time. So um, the fee will be the 0.05% fee, which is different from their 0.3%. The going in and out of Ethereum is still going to cost something because there's going to be, you're going to have to go in to the Varus ecosystem from Ethereum and come back out, and that's not going to be free. So there's going to be a cost, but it's not about the percentage of the conversion. So that's going to mean that, you know, there's going to be some size of transaction where that'll make sense. And under that, you're probably not going to want to be sending it across just to do that. But over that, you're going to be getting a better deal than any of the other systems. And of course, if you send your, your funds over to Varus and leave them over in Varus, you're going to get a lot better fees structure. So um, we're going to be inherently less expensive. And when there's more volume of transactions, it will stabilize a Varus fractional currency rather than, uh, you know, where it would destabilize the same market cap of a Uniswap liquidity pool. But at the end of the day, it's just going to be, you know, you're probably not going to want to send tiny little transactions over to be converted and sent back to Ethereum. You're probably going to want to send only bigger ones over. Uh, they're going to join the conversions that are happening on the Varus network. And then they're going to go back to the Ethereum network. Um, but it's interesting because the entire Varus DeFi platform will be accessible even with its better pricing and better stability and everything else. And it's not stuff you could do with a contract. So, but it's going to be accessible through Ethereum and Ethereum contracts. So it's going to be very interesting um, when this is available. And it's exciting to work on. And then the other thing is that PVAS is actually going to work the same way. So um, it, it all looks like it's coming together quite well. And at the same time, you know, I wish that it would be finished now already, but it, it has to be as good as it has to be we can't turn it on and and ha expect to have millions or more you know dollars or whatever currencies running over it um until it's really ready for that to happen and you know it's one thing to make something that just works on a test net and it's another thing to make something that you know we don't want to take a detour just to show people that it can work when we get it out to testnet, it's going to be the thing that we expect to then finish and roll out to mainnet. And, uh, and getting that, the cross network, cross Ethereum, cross Varus proof back and forth in a way that works the way that it should, but also opens up channels for functionality. The other thing that, you know, I'm not even talking about or focused on. This BDXF, the Varus Data Exchange Format, um, we're using it now for functionality 
that goes across systems and that and that goes across um you know ethereum and Verus. and so it'll be possible in the future for people to define vdxf codes that would allow you to actually trigger functionality from one system to another um so it isn't just the currency that can go across it's it's really a, this gateway to ethereum and doing it along with the um you know making sure that it is the same model as pbas and, and aligning these things it's going to be huge i think well i don't want to i'm not trying to hype anything um it's it's going to be big i think um so as far as the fees being two percent i think that just relates to the size of a transaction if you're doing you know a million dollar transaction on uniswap you're gonna have a lot of slippage but i think the percentage if you're seeing two percent it's a combination of high ethereum fees generally and then they've got a 0.3 percent whereas we have an inherently 0.05 percent um for a reserve to reserve and if you're just converting to a fractional then it's half of that but then there you'll still have the fees to go across from ethereum to varus from varus to ethereum if you're going over the bridge the only yeah, time bishop that's Osh. oh go ahead sorry yeah no go ahead uh bishop Osh, bishop Osh in the, the marketing channel uh would this update push the vault functionality and then 100 uh fee pool out uh, to when the release hits main at an early 21. Oh, Varus Vault. Is this going to be aligned with Varus Vault and uh, and what was the other? Uh, the, the spreading people. of the fees the over multiple blocks. Uh, yes, people. yes. Um, so this will come out in in a release together. The uh, Varus Vault, I mean, we could do two releases, but I I would not want to do that. Um, because if we're going to do one, so the fee pool is really an interesting, uh, capability as well, because, you know, the fee pool impacts miners and in fact, oh, I didn't, I didn't explain how this actually works. So not only does the fee pool impact miners, but the, um, uh, bridge impacts miners and stakers as well. So the way that it's going to work is every miner and staker will be able to actually contribute to the ethereum bridge because there will be a uh we're, we're calling it so if anybody you know it probably dates me but if anybody knows monty python at all the bridge keeper's name in monty python um name was alan and so we're calling the this uh, code name of the bridge keeper alan and and so basically miners and stakers will be able to run allen and when you run allen it's going to be um you're going to be putting notarizations of the ethereum uh and varus blockchains into your um block when you're able to do that and if your notarization is agreed upon by notaries and used for um for the bridge you'll get a percentage of the fees uh that 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 bridge crossing generates which could include you know a lot of um of conversions and transactions in one bridge crossing because the protocol aggregates different transactions on the bridge crossing and so various miners and stakers will be able to actually generate and this is um it doesn't go into the fee pool actually uh those fees will still come back to you when you generate a notarization that gets approved those fees will still come back to you but then other fees will go into the fee pool um but that allows miners and stakers to get uh fees and it makes it a little more complicated for pools you know because a pool is going to uh, want to do this for people, and so they're going to have some model for doing it. And, and in a way, it's like for a pool, it kind of creates, um, you know, almost an automatic loyalty thing, because they could just feed those bridge fees back into the 
um, the pool shares would be a reasonable way to do that. Um, and then when PBAS mining comes in, it's going to be the same thing. And the fee pool is not something. So right now, for people who don't know how uh, pools work, it's quite often the case that a pool will take a block from the demon <coughs> or a template for a block and it will use that as a template and it will make a lot of the transactions like the Coinbase and it'll make this other stuff. And so what we're building into the demon is the ability for the pool to specify the normal things that pool software does itself. And the demon will just incorporate that into the uh, Coinbase that it makes so that pool software can do a little bit less and that things like merge mining and bridge keeping and these kinds of fees will naturally be easier to use for a pool. Um, so it's kind of important if we were to say have um, the fee pool and Veris Vault on IDs and we just release those. By the way, Veris Vault is, you know, it's hardened and ready to release. The fee pool is not doesn't doesn't need more hardening but at the same time if we were to just release those it would mean that we need to update pool software and other things and and then we would still have this other release coming so it would mean much later on this other stuff and we're not wanting to make it much later it's just that with the holidays coming up and the fact that we are in december right now it just seems realistic rather than rush things out and believe that we you know, have everything right. We'd rather get it all together, get it onto testnet, make sure everybody can use it, then get the testing mileage on it and get it rolled out when it can be a nice smooth rollout with this capability for both the entire Verus network and also Ethereum. Because I think actually with what we're gonna be releasing, this could be big news for Ethereum. And uh, and the nice thing about it is this same bridge that we're doing for <clears throat> for Ethereum would allow anyone, you know, <coughs> excuse me, would allow anyone really to do bridges more easily. In addition to just supporting PBAS, but it would allow anyone to do bridges more easily. Any other questions? When you say that, yeah, what are we bridges from other coin communities? I didn't hear that question. Can I hear that again? Yeah. When you said it would allow other people to do bridges more easily, do you mean other coin communities doing bridges? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it'll it'll basically make it so that... So what we're doing is we're making it so that this bridge process... So any Ethereum-like coin, you know, Ethereum Classic or other derivatives from Ethereum, they'll be easy to bridge and also to bridge all of the currencies on them if they have you know, ERC-20 like currencies, um, that'll be easy to bridge. But just getting this in place, we're going to, we're going to, on the first release with the first bridge, we're not going to make it something that everybody can make a bridge, but the model really is going to be that, you know, everybody should be able to make a bridge. Um, it's just that there is, go there's likely going to have to be for some set of bridges there's going to have to be a fork when you enable a certain set of bridges. But, you know, there's still going to be the ability for other um, projects, other communities to both bridge and also there are some uh, currency communities talking about because with the VDXF and, and the functionality that, that we have with IDs and um when those are combined what we're able to do uh and this is stuff that i just i can't get into all the details on because i just it's just a more a matter of time and staying focused on getting these things out um there are some currency communities like projects that would like to say move over to a pbas chain because you know any currency project that goes to a pbas chain basically gets all of the DeFi capabilities on its own chain and, and it will get an automatic bridge to Varus as well. And with that bridge, 
a PBAS chain, like a one-step removed PBAS chain, so a PBAS chain that was started from Varus, will be able to bridge through Varus to the Ethereum platform as well, and will have DeFi on its on its chain as well as the ability to make um, to make IDs. So, you know, you could see that that might be a really attractive option for uh currency communities that already have you know a project so we're talking about some that would do that but also if a if a currency project or another community wanted to just bridge and it could use the same technology as we're using for the ethereum bridge and for the pbas bridges to bridge as well that's exciting stuff yeah, I, I, I'm excited about it, but I'm also conflicted because it's like I did want things to be finished and out sooner, although my vision, my previous vision for what those things were going to be able to do was less than what we're seeing now. And, uh, and so it's exciting, and at the same time, I, as much as anyone, feel the pressure of you know, wanting to make sure that we actually get this out as soon as possible with all of its capabilities. But the, the really cool thing to me is that being able to use these um, bridges and converters and fractional currencies directly from the entire Ethereum ecosystem or the Varus ecosystem and leaving, putting your currencies that you say convert to into a Varus ID or putting them back into an Ethereum address it seems to make this something much more interesting and impactful to the Ethereum community than I had initially been um, thinking of because it basically is a new DeFi universe that will be open to and on Ethereum that goes beyond what any of their contracts currently do. Um, would it also make sense to make some kind of a stress test once it's on, uh, on testnet? Or do you think that uh, you can get the data from just running it on a test net? Well, I mean, I, we, we run stress tests. I'd be happy to have people doing that. I, I don't want to make a big PR thing like that. I'm, I don't think that's the... I mean, I'm more focused on just let's test it. Yes, stress tests will be good when it's on test net. But we should then say, okay, now is t a good time for you know, either doing that or we should just run them. Um, uh, uh, I mean, yes, that's a good thing to do before. Definitely, we'd rather have stress on it before it goes live, but um, I'm not, you know, it's like uh, that's part of what we do on testnet at different times. So, yes. When I hear people talking about Ethereum, they, they start with Bitcoin, how it was like a simple Turing in complete language where it's just set takes a simple set of uh, inputs and outputs and converts money. So Ethereum was born because Solidity allowed you to write anything you want. How would you defend that sort of argument against Verus that it's not got the programming language of Ethereum? Yeah, you know, Ethereum you could maybe think of as... Ethereum was not really just born because people wanted to write everything they want. Ethereum was born because there was a system created with decentralized and secure transaction processing that was that stagnated because um, its original vision for being programmable was stunted by a community that decided it was only going to be used for a subset of its original vision. And then another community came along with, with smart people who didn't have a lot of, you know, um, application platform, uh, like, creation experience. And they made a lot of the same mistakes, which is, you know, they created a platform that runs everything sequentially on a big, giant, you know, sequential computer that runs worldwide across all these different computers. And um, and they focused on the programming language as the way that everything connects. 
and the programming environment as the way that everything connects, when in fact we're already in a world of many different programming languages and many different programming environments, and things connect through data. And, you know, Bitcoin shows that these large decentralized systems, they're based on currency, they're based on like there are some fundamental use cases. Everyone was saying, what's the use case for crypto? And they were saying, what's the use case for crypto as Bitcoin kept growing and growing and it's being used as finance, as money. And they in the in the contracts that people would develop on Ethereum that were not letting them develop everything, because in order to develop an application, you had to develop the contract. Then you had to develop the application that used it. The contracts were all about doing some basic things like making a currency or an emission schedule or, you know, now it's DeFi or uh, NFTs like Crypto Kitties or these, but basic things that have to do with blockchain decentralized, you know, kind of um, common types of agreements, governance, you know, voting. It's all the same kind of thing. And then you have the biggest applications, arguably the biggest brave. It's not written in solidity at all. And and you still have now all these problems that this platform on top of a blockchain that was abstracted in a way where the blockchain doesn't understand the finance on top of it. And that means that the fee structure on Ethereum now is out of whack so that the fees can create perverse incentives for the applications that run above the blockchain that are now abstracted and divorced from what's really going on to create security problems, which is why we even have a fee pool to begin with. It's why the, the, that problem still isn't solved on Ethereum. And it's why, you know, there are layer two economies that are at conflict with the blockchain consensus layer, because instead of actually kind of factoring out what really mattered in what the real use cases were what really mattered what's the fundamental primitive what are the primitives that a system needs and that and how do you make an application system that can communicate through data they just punted all of that into you know well we'll have a very primitive blockchain layer and then we'll have a language running on top of it that is a sequential computer worldwide. And, you know, that just isn't, in the long run, how systems are going to be built and scale. And what we're doing is we're saying uh, the whole Internet's built on exchange of data. Large distributed and decentralized systems are built on exchange of data. And the VDXF gives us an ability to say, you can, you can make, you can define data structures yourself that you can publish. You can share them across these kind of bridges and gateways. You can have a blockchain system that it doesn't have to have a Turing complete programming language in it as much as you can add just about any capability or functionality in that system you want, and you can bridge it to others. But at the fundamental level, it comes with currencies because it should, and it comes with um, basic DeFi because it should because the, and it comes with IDs because because these are basic primitives that make sense in a decentralized blockchain system and you don't need to reinvent them over and over and over again just so that you can program and say you program in some language you know that runs sequentially on a worldwide computer they're just already there so you can use them and you can make applications that use them because that's mostly what people are doing, you know, and now you can bridge them to solidity. So you could expose VDXF codes on your Ethereum contracts and you could call them from Varus and you could write in solidity and you could call Varus, you know, from Ethereum. You could do it either way and on this gateway. So, you know, if you really feel strongly one way or the other, you can have both. But in the long run, the decentralized internet is going to be built of heterogeneous systems exchanging data that they can all understand. And some of them will be decentralized completely and some of them will be centralized. And that's just the way it's going to be. Yes, yeah, that's 
I hope you understand that was a loaded question because we're, we're writing articles at the moment trying to just explain what Varus is about and that really helps with uh, you know, comparing it against current. Yeah, I mean, you could think of, yeah. I don't, I don't want to use analogies for Ethereum that denigrate it, you know, that make no, it... No, no, we'll never do that. It's just... Uh, what it, I'm saying right just now is... Just to start I, where I, it comes from, where Varus comes from, what we've noticed, what happened. No, where Bitcoin Bitcoin came from? What it was, yeah, so so like right now, decided what we can do with blockchain. Basically, what can well, we do? So, is the question. Well, so right now, I can give you kind of a, an idea of how this works with the VDXF. So, if you've got you know on the Ethereum bridge, um, you have say uh, I want to prove um, you know what's called a state route. So. On the Varus blockchain, we have this Merkle Mountain range. And if you can prove the Merkle Mountain range, then you can prove anything on the blockchain behind it. On the Ethereum system, they have a state route. On a Komodo-based system, there's going to be some kind of a, a notary-based Merkle of Merkles. Okay? But let's just talk about Ethereum for right now. Ethereum and, and Varus are very similar in the fact that there's a one-number route, and it covers the whole blockchain. and so. For a proof of each system across the other, we have this notarization model. And I want to, um, so say we have a set of notaries and there's a, say, minimum number of notaries that must agree for something to be considered, um, you know, manually notarized by those notarized, notaries, okay? So the notaries create a signature for an output which is a notarization and they can create those on their own so there doesn't need to be some special notary network to do this they just can create those um, and they do it using VDXF they actually put a VDXF code which is notary signature you no know? and so the signature itself signs the fact that they are attesting to this notarization across ethereum and across Verus, which gives someone on ethereum or on Verus the ability to prove transactions that existed on the other one okay and it's this vdxf statement which these are friendly name statements that anyone with an id can publish it looks like uh id colon colon and then uh name dot name dot name dot name so this looks like VRSC colon colon uh, system dot notarization dot signature, you know, and then that be through this VDXF uh, algorithm gets hashed down to 20 bytes. They always get hashed down to 20 bytes. And so, you know, no one's ever going to have 20 bytes in a row that will look like this. So if you ever see those 20 bytes in a row, someone is saying it is that thing always and so we then on on the ethereum side the ethereum contract can take all of those um signatures it doesn't have to collect them one by one like it did on the Verus blockchain it can take say 13 signatures and it can just validate them once but it can use this code to make sure that they're exactly the signatures they're supposed to be signing the thing that they're supposed to sign for the purpose that they were supposed to sign it for and somebody else could make, you know, a different reason for those notaries to sign something and it would not be seen as the same signature and it would never be confused. And and this model, it just opens the doors for actually, I'm not, we're not working on this right now, but like you could have multiple gateways between Ethereum and Verus and they could do different things. A project that is an Ethereum coin could make its own gateway, you know, so there, in the long run, this allows any different blockchain or decentralized or centralized system to effectively create a gateway to another decentralized, centralized, or centralized system and communicate with it in a way that's reliable, that makes sense. And, you know, the fact that we can do a call from, that we will be able to do a call from Ethereum, which is like a transaction. So I'll be able to use MetaMask to send a transaction 
from Ethereum through a Varus converter, through a Varus fractional reserve currency, and back out to my Ethereum address. And, and as a user, I won't really have to know that that actually went to a whole other blockchain network and did that and then came back. It'll take a little while because it's going to take a little while to confirm it. And as the technology gets better, it'll get faster and faster, you know. But the first release is going to take, I don't know how fast, it might take, you know, half an hour for something to go out and back. But it's going to be a fair price and it's going to be a low fee. And I'm not going to have to worry about front running and all the funny games people play. If I'm a user, I'm just going to convert and it's going to come back. And the more people who use it, the more fair it's going to be. And, and over time, there will be ways to lower the prices. <clears throat> and so that I can do that means that any blockchain system will be able to do that over time. So just because Ethereum has DeFi in it doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to take something like um, Neo that doesn't have, you know, a DeFi solution or, you know, uh, maybe they maybe they do now or another one, you know, or any any project that doesn't have a DeFi solution and allow them to just plug right in. And that's because this is a way for decentralized distributed applications to be built not just contracts that do one small part of what an application really is. And this is the only place where I know of where, you know, I pay the fees on Ethereum and I, and, and I make things happen on other systems. And that's because the DeFi system is connected in such a way where the fees can be converted as part of the process. I would be really interested to see anyone else do that anytime soon. Uh, it was to to plug it in in a way that makes sense required a lot of consideration and a lot of thought and a lot of work and and a lot of what we already have in place ready to make that happen. So, you know, the ability to actually make everything seamless for users and not to make a user have to go well. Jesus, I've got to go get my Varus and I've got to send Varus to this address and then I've got to send ETH to this address and then I'm going to send my BAT to this address so that I can convert my BAT into DAI. You know, instead they just get to do a normal send and it all gets to just happen. And, and this is the model for how systems will convert their different, you know, currencies that power their different platforms to the ones that so, so like if I send a current, if I send a transaction from Ethereum to Varus and back, it's really interesting. The, the way that that's solved and the way it works is there's, there's like a second leg fee, like pass-through fees. And the pass-through fees get converted. As they pass through a system, they get converted to the, to the fees of the other system so that they can just be used along the route. And, you know, there aren't, you need to have DeFi integrated into the system, not at a layer above written in a language running above that the blockchain doesn't know about, to be able to have packets that can pass through one system, convert the fees that power them, use what's needed, and then come back out to the other system and have all the participants, the miners, the stakers, you know, notaries, and uh, and the users all just see things in a way that makes sense for them. Does that make any sense? Because that's actually a very underappreciated set of challenges that we have. That that's that's those are the solutions that we're working to roll out. Sounds incredible. And I do have one question or kind of statement. Um, a few months back, Ethereum had a competition, uh, basically looking for solutions to their high gas fees until they can get uh, whatever ETH 2.0 out, which will probably be a year plus. Um, and there was quite a few comp uh, projects in competition trying to win it. ETH, ETH DAI is the one I think that won and the one that has, I guess, the highest competition. They actually got a lot of backing from the Ethereum Foundation to help solve this. And it sounds like what is in this mix is a solve to their transaction fees as well. Is that a correct statement? Well, it basically gives them something that's much, much more powerful than the Lightning Network to rely on. But at the same time, you know, 
I mean, the entire Varus network is its own network. And when we plug this in, um, I mean, yeah, we could have gotten here with contests and, and, but I'd rather do what is right for our vision and for Varus. And then if it, you know, maybe at some point, maybe the, the Ethereum foundation will contribute to the effort. But right now, we just need to get it done because it's the right thing to do. And this is of for course. everyone, you know. It just sounded like, and within that conversation, I was kind of distracted by the kids, but it sounded like you would be able to be on the Ethereum network, send a transaction or a conversion. They wouldn't even know it, but it would come through the Varus network, charge less fees somehow, and then go to their end destination. Well, that's the, no way, that's the way it's going to work. But part of the reason is because... Um, with our 0.05% fee, we believe that we can reward the miners, the stakers, all the participants, mm -hmm. um, you know, just fine and make a better system for users. And then we got Varus Vault and we got the uh, uh, a model for, you know, more secure blockchain when you've got this running on it. And so we would prefer that people you know, leave the Ethereum network, live mostly in Varus, and actually call Ethereum if they want functionality from Ethereum. But um, because it's going to be a more um, fractal platform anyways, you know, with PBAS and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the reason I'm bringing But I, I don't know. I mean, look, I, I, I don't know. Uh, that's what I'm saying. I, those, those things and contests like that, they don't motivate me. So... That wasn't the point. The, 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 the main point is I see it as a marketing opportunity to say that it's, it's a solution to... But I just know, don't know what I'm saying is I have no idea how they'll take it and I don't have time to talk to them oh, about okay. how they'll take it right now because um, if, if they could either see it as, yeah, everyone's going to pay less fees or they could see it as, oh, but people are going to be leaving Ethereum. Okay, yeah. Great. So I, I just don't know. For me, I just think this is the right way for things to work. And it's how it should be. And, you know, to Bishop's other question, I feel like it would be in the long run better for everyone and faster for the entire mm. industry to get this all out together than to get out like Varus Vault <clears throat> and the fee pool now. Um, because I think if we do, then it's going to be months before we get this other thing out. And I'd like to get this working as soon as possible out on. The network and then rolled out to mainnet as soon as we validate it with stress tests and everything else but i mean just full you know test net testing um and i think the fastest path to do that is finish it get it rolled out i mean if, if someone thinks that there's a different if someone has a different thought or a different opinion i'd be happy to hear it but that's that's what um uh, that's what I'm convinced right now makes the most sense for everything because of, because when this actually is available and people can use it, I think it's going to change perception quite a lot. Any other thoughts or questions? Or This is a great description you did. Can we take this audio and uh, chop it up and reuse it? Sure. Sure. I mean, this is the easiest way I think of getting the information out. I'm going to have to listen to it again personally. All right. I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'm actually, I just realized I'm going to actually have to run. Uh, so I hope this has been useful. And I'm going to go back to me. Yeah. I know I've been scarce lately, and there's a reason for that, because I've been working, like, constantly on getting this stuff done. And I have wanted to, you know, I until very recently still wanted to get the whole thing out this year. And, and looking at it, I, I really just... I believe we'll get the test net rolled out that'll show the stuff I'm talking about. But what I'm, um, I'm not, I don't believe it would be wise to push for getting the main net version out until early next year. So. Yeah. You're not disappointed with the content. That's for sure. All right. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Have a great evening or day or whatever it is for you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you.